once I start talking, you're going to, it's, it just starts coming out and you're going to be like, God damn it. We're going to need that extra 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, before we start then, I just want to check in. Uh, I want to ask you some pretty personal questions about, uh, yeah. about the, the experience of getting admitted to the hospital. Um, is sure. there, is there anything that you'd like me to know in advance is off limits? Oh, no. I prefer to dive in and explore all of the most sensible, uh, sensitive, little vulnerable aspects of life and ourselves and the human condition and our personal experiences. So let's get into it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James Debugesso. You are listening to episode 103, featuring comedian Shane Moss as our uh, primary guest. This podcast is brought to you by the amazing support of my patrons on Patreon, especially people whose names are listed on the screen here or in the show notes to this episode at jameswjesso.com or wherever you are catching the podcast. And uh, yeah, huge thanks, guys, um, and very much appreciate it. Could not continue the show or my larger work in and for psychedelic culture without, uh, without your financial contributions, so thank you. Big thanks to the other people leaving PayPal donations, buying t-shirts on the shop, uh, as well as purchasing lectures and books. Um, thanks to everyone doing that, which is also an invitation to anyone not doing it who would like to support the show, you can do that. PayPal donations, purchasing stuff on jameswjesso.com forward slash shop, or becoming my patron on Patreon. All of those options are at jameswjesso.com forward slash support or very conveniently located somewhere in the description, somewhere easy to find in the description uh, of this episode, wherever you are listening slash watching it. All right, jumping in today, we have Shane Moss. Shane Moss has brought his unique blend of humor, insights, and storytelling to cities all over the world. He has appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live, Comedy Central, Showtime, BBC, Epics, and has five appearances on Conan. He has also been a popular guest on other top podcasts like Pete Holmes' You've Made It Weird, This Past Weekend with Theo Vaughn, Mark Warren's WTF, The Joe Rogan Experience, Dunkel Trussell's Family, Duncan Trussell's Family Hour, Bert Cass, and more. Each week, as the curator and host of the Science Podcast, here we are. Shane interviews the world's leading academics about our most fascinating traits and behaviors while finding the funny in the intermost workings of life. The podcast has led to his latest tour, Stand Up Science, where he joins together comedians and scientists on the same stage for a night of learning and laughs. His MAPS Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies sponsored solo show, A Good Trip, earned Shane a large following and high praise for its balance of comedy and insight into modern psychedelic research while describing the ineffable. Shane is the subject of the new documentary film, Psychonautics, a comics exploration of psychedelics. Shane is on the show to talk primarily about psychonautics, and I'm choosing to situate Shane now, uh, even though previous episode I mentioned trying to shuffle up the gender ethnic representation, and we've got three white guys in a row, um, and it's because of the relevancy of the topic. Um, the last episode, if you heard it, was about spirits and entities, but I brought that up um, that specific time because of its involvement um, or its relationship to my recently passed colleague, Tobias. And the episode here with Shane, I mean, there's some stuff about the documentary and about psychedelics and so on and so forth, but ultimately it's a deep talk about how he ended up in the psych ward as a consequence of his excessive use of psychedelics. And if you happen to listen to the recent video that I put up around the context around Tobias's death 
which is either already up or about to be up on my YouTube channel, then you'll understand why Shane's experience of, of psychedelic induced psychosis is relevant as a theme in these last few weeks in my life and basically in the, the sort of content arc of the show. So a couple things specifically about this episode, um, audio's moderate, uh, the video feed drops out at, uh, at one point because the audio was getting clunky and we just cut the video. Um, but if you're just listening to it, that doesn't mean anything to you. Additionally, I, I kind of, this is maybe unnecessary, but I sort of like, I threw some like salty teasing with Shane right at the beginning of the interview, which at the time felt all right. Cause he was like, He's a comedian and we would have been having this like funny back and forth beforehand and that's how i engage with my friends in the comedic fashion but then in hindsight i kind of felt it was really unprofessional um and i'm just openly saying that um because i learned a valuable lesson in hindsight about how not to be playfully salty with my guests even if it was fine um this has nothing to do with the interview with Shane, but I'm just going to throw it in there. Uh, Shane is going to be doing a comedy special around the Breaking Convention Conference in England, and the event is on Thursday, August 15th, and uh, I'll make a link to that in the episode here uh, because it would be your opportunity to go check them out if you're already going to be in town for Breaking Convention, which I will be, and so I will also be making the effort to go check that out, and maybe I will see you there. That's basically it uh, for for the intro kind of stuff. So please enjoy this episode with Shane Moss here on Adventures Through the Mind. All right. Well, then, uh, I just watched Psychonautics last night, actually, with a friend of mine. Uh, liked oh, cool. it. Laughed. Thanks. Uh, I almost cried at one point, but it was when, oh. when Rick... Well, you know, I'm sorry. It wasn't about you. Uh, but oh, it was okay. it, Rick well, Doblin. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's the, that's the, the movie is my little piece of art that I that I made. So uh, all of it's a, a part of that. All right, all right, yeah. I was teasing, yeah, you, teasing you a little bit, right. anyways. But when anytime I hear R- Doblin say, you know, two thirds success rate with MDMA, I like, I just, I like start tearing up because yeah, it's so amazing, it's and it's also so sad because there are so many people that are still just like suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, yeah. Yeah. Usually so. and a, a lot of it is like the people, um, the, the people that, that are, you know, think of the people that are enforcing the drug laws, <laughs> like, like all, all the police, the military and whatnot and enfor- enforcing and that are part of the war on drugs that are getting PTSD because like uh, indirectly caused by like violence and things like that caused by the war on drugs and the and the treatment for that um for that stuff that wouldn't be happening if there wasn't a war on drugs anyway the treatment for it they can't get to because of the war on drugs it's ridiculous you know i hadn't actually thought i you know i've I've thought deeply about how prohibition actually creates most of the problems that prohibition claims to solve um, right. but, uh, I hadn't thought of that particular circular, uh, that's, that sort of bind. Um, yeah. but let's, I want to, I want to target in your, your documentary, uh, shows your experience, uh, and, you know, correct me where my synopsis is a bit off here. It shows your experience of basically trying to say, Hey, psychedelics aren't that bad for you. Watch, I'll take all of them. Um, <laughs> and then you go through and systematically talk about psilocybin, uh, MDMA, yeah. LSD, ketamine, DMT, ayahuasca. Of that, the only one that we don't see you either take or talk about taking is MDMA, which you focus more on the medical research. Um, and that's yeah. sort of... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I... So some things happened. Well, you, you see uh, you see within the documentary that, uh, you know, I end up uh, having some mental health issues. And, right, right. Which is really say it's couched in this mental health crisis yeah. at the beginning and at the end. Yeah. So the behind the scenes of what happened there was was even even um, so in the in the end, I, I don't really think this spoils much of anything. And I, I think it'll just make it interesting for people that are watching it. But, um, you know, the editor 
um, made sure to like have something with a storyline that was easy to follow and transitioned well. And within that, we had to do things like, um, you know, the driving scene of me saying like, I'm going to take, um, I, I'm going to go and do this, um, uh, like underground ayahuasca session right now. That was all actually that, that, that one scene and one other little thing as a transition was actually shot after the fact mm -hmm. when I, the ayahuasca that sent me over the edge, what I was actually going to, I went to go and do ayahuasca to prepare for doing ayahuasca on camera. Huh. I had done ayahuasca before and it was a really mild experience. Yeah. And I wanted to like dial in like what, what I wanted my experience to, I wanted it to be a little more intense than what I had gotten in the past. And so I was trying to like find, so I went a little heavy trying to like find what my limit was a little bit and then like walk it back a little bit so that we could then record me doing ayahuasca on camera. And then I lost my mind. Um, and we never got to do that and had to like make things work with, with what with the footage that we had and mm -hmm. and everything and the story that we had and mdma um was another thing that that um you know we had planned on filming me doing mdma with like maybe my girlfriend or um or some friends or something like that we we weren't sure exactly what but um i had had those mental health issues from the ayahuasca during the recording before that I, I i was maybe going to be doing like peyote 5mao maybe iboga i was i was potentially going to be doing more experiences than mm. what was ultimately shown in the documentary but i got stopped short <laughs> of that um because of uh my ayahuasca experience well i want to i want to talk with you a little bit more about that in in depth afterwards because i feel like um sure having having watched the documentary enjoyed it like it, it had this great balance of um i guess factual information you had a great uh you had a great curation of talking heads uh with yeah. with stuff that was really relatable um in the sense of you just talking about like why is this meaningful for me um and then stuff that was funny like moments, like for example, with the, psil <laughs> the psilocybin trip, like just funny moments that also felt really genuine in a way that sort of gave the opportunity for us to get this valuable information, but in a way that was really easy and in a way that uh, also was enjoyable. And uh, clips from your uh, from your stand up as well, like great, like hilarious little pieces in, in the middle. Yeah. And and the and one of the biggest limitations was that there wasn't more about your mental health crisis because I feel like it ended and I was like, whoa, what? Wait, what? Like you, you close it up nicely, but my mind was like, no, no, no. I'm glad I'm talking to this guy tomorrow because I want to know a lot more about what, what happened there. Um, so maybe we I can... mean, Please. I was in, in terms of that, in terms of how it, how the documentary ended, it was just kind of this unfortunate scenario of we had deadlines that we wanted to finish it to submit it for festivals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was having like, even, even though board for just a week, but I was, I was still, um, in a exceptionally manic, um, and paranoid state for, some time after that, um, months really. And, and it was, um, it was, I, I basically had to take a step back and couldn't really be involved with the documentary. Uh, like they, they had to like take over and finish it without, like I was able to record some voiceover here and there when you caught me on a good day, but on a bad day, I thought that like, you know, this is all some Truman show thing that I was a part of. And the documentary was like this I, weird, like conspiracy or something like, you know, I had a lot of weird paranoia issues at that time. So that's another part of the reason why, um, you know, it just didn't, um, it, it would have, it would have been a much, 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 much different documentary 
had I not had the mental health issues, mm-hmm. but the, the, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. And at the end of the day, it was, if I was going to have a mental health issue from psychedelics, and this is the first time it had ever happened, um, I'm happy that it happened during the documentary because I, I think it really made things really interesting, gave a lot of balance. I think it would have been a really um, evangelically pro-psychedelic documentary had that not happened to mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of happy and relieved that there is that built-in disclaimer. In fact, I I, I got some some review of it that was like you know they liked it but they were like rated it poorly because they're like this didn't give enough disclaimers for people i'm like not enough disc the whole documentary is a disclaimer like it's it's like inherent within the documentary hey uh, here's here's the thing you need to know from from the first minute i lost my fucking mind from psychedelics <laughs> That's a that's a disclaimer if I've ever heard one. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you even say you say right in the beginning that you're like, oh, I'm making this documentary. I'm going to prove that I can take all these drugs and they're good for me. Oh, and I just got out of a mental institution. <laughs> yeah. uh, now that now that is something that I found particularly interesting, and it is something that um, in my you know research experiences and explorations that I found to be quite um, sort of like a noticeable trend is that people can take psychedelics for many years. Uh, You've been taking psilocybin mushrooms as you express for a long time, LSD, all these other things. And then for the most part, you're fine. I mean, you, you express that you knew that you had a predisposition uh, to, to buy, to bipolar, that you had a bipolar disorder, but in a very, very mild way. Yeah. But then along comes ayahuasca and it completely sends you into a full-blown psychotic episode requiring hospitalization and from pharmaceutical treatment yeah looking back at your experiences and i I do want to ask you in depth about the ayahuasca thing looking back at your experiences what about what was it about these earlier ones that you think prevented you from being set off why did these other psychedelic experiences not launch you into a full-blown psychotic episode well, I think there's a lot of factors, um, and and I don't and I don't think it was like just the ayahuasca. I think it was the frequency of. So there's a lot of information here to <laughs> to share. Um, so so feel free to cut me off uh, at, at any moment or ask me for more clarity or anything. So. Um, one, I think the reason why it's never been an issue in the past is because often when I do, and and mushrooms are my go-to, and often when I do mushrooms, I've done a lot of DMT as well, but DMT is such a like, you're in and you're out and it's like, what the fuck was that? And it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to. Like there's the DMT space and then there's this reality and there's just like, no, for, for me, at least in my mind and my perception, those two things, those two experiences have basically nothing to do with one another and like no interaction. This is one reality. That's a completely other reality. Um, and so I think that's why whereas ayahuasca was like, um, it's more like DMT meets this world and there's that DMT space is interacting and influencing this world. Um, so that was confusing, um, for me, but I think that in the past I'd often done mushrooms specifically when I did large doses, it was, um, when I was in depressed states and it would knock me it, you know, out of my depression, it would help with the depression and sometimes launch me into like a nice, like hypomanic state, which was like really an ideal <laughs> scenario. Hypomania is the dream. Like if you can, <laughs> if you can be hypomanic, like if it's a sustainable thing, like 
everyone would want to be hypomanic all, uh, all of the time. Like it's absolutely incredible. Um, and, but, and it never went past that for me. And, and even, you know, it never even got to that most of the time, but it would, it would help with depression. Not always, but pretty reliably, um, mushrooms would help with my depression. So I often wasn't like in a manic state already and then doing mushrooms. Hmm. So, or, or maybe it would have happened earlier. I don't know. During the documentary, you know, like I said, it may have been a, or, or would have been a completely different documentary um, had this not happened. So, so here's just a little, here's how the documentary came together. Someone reached out to me um, who had done, you know, produced comedy specials and stuff and was a guy involved in the industry and um, managed comedians for a while and shoot stuff. He always wanted to like do a documentary or something like that or, or make a TV show and start doing s stuff outside of comedy specials, but to do with them with comics. He thought my story was really interesting. Um, we talked about doing a documentary. Didn't even know what about. Um, I, I just knew I wanted to do a science documentary um, or something getting, getting researchers on camera and stuff. I have a science podcast called mm -hmm. Here We Are. Um, and you know, psychedelics is like, I, out of the 230 episodes that I've had on my science podcast, I've had maybe 10 episodes about psychedelic research. It's a pretty small uh, percentage of my, my interests in that realm, but I was touring with my psychedelic show called the good trip, which was this 111 city tour that got all this like press and I was on all these big podcasts and stuff talking about it. That's where he heard me talking about it on Mark Marin. And so I had been invited to do this comedy gala during the 2017 psychedelic science conference in Oakland, because I had been working with maps maps was the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies was sponsoring my tour and blah, blah, blah. And I, um, so we, we decided, um, long story short, like not exactly knowing what we are doing. We're like, you know, this conference is only once every four years. It's the who's who of psychedelic research. Let's just go there and just record a bunch of researchers talking about what they do, mm. figure the rest out from there. So we just went there, set up, uh, turned my hotel room into a studio and just had researcher after researcher come in and just like give a half hour spiel and ask them questions and stuff. That's how we got all those amazing yeah, talking great. heads people. Yeah. And so that was all those talking heads was mostly for, for the most part, just in, uh, just in like that three or four day, um, window, you know, we had a really low budget. So, so there wasn't, and then, Afterwards, we were like, okay, now what do we do? And as like, I guess we, we, we had a sense that maybe we were going to be putting my stand up in. They wanted to do that, the director and editor and, and producer. I, at first, was kind of against including my stand up in the documentary. I'm glad I changed my mind eventually because I liked how it turned out. Um, but my favorite part is when I'm not on camera. I, I like the talking heads. I, I like hearing the research. I think that's the important stuff that people need to know about. Mm -hmm. But it was nice that my jokes got to like add some um, lightness to it and, and you know keep people's attention and everything. Well, so also anyhow, you're, a rela you're a relatable person, right? And so it's, it's a lot easier, I think, as a, as a general person, it seems like your documentary is made for the average person, not for the deep psycho, not really curious about the next phase of research, right? That's, that's what the hope was. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think your average psycho, not, um, the hope is, is that, you know, maybe they'll, they, they get some laughs yeah, the, out of it. I enjoyed and, it, right? So, and, yeah. you know, be happy that like more people are going to hear about psychedelics from this film. But yeah. I don't think your average psychonaut's going to learn a lot in terms of research from this. This was really targeted toward trying to find ways of exposing new people to yeah. 
the world of psychedelic research. Um, that that is um, where I think the most most interest can be made. I mean, any psychonaut out there already knows more than they need to about psychedelics. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, but, uh, so, you know, we had these interviews. Now what do we do? I guess we just show me doing psychedelics. All right, let's plan some like experiences or whatever. And we are trying to feel that out. And so I just started also just doing lots of mostly mushrooms are my jam. At the same time, I had like gone through depression with, um, figuring out some stuff in my life and, and I'm just really susceptible to these large, long, like two month long depressive episodes anyway, that usually happen like once a year or so. And usually around the same time, this is around February or March or so. And that's I, it's a thing that I get around that time. And so I, I did, I was doing mushrooms for the depression and to like kind of get in that headspace for the documentary and normally I would do mushrooms and you know, if I, if I feel like I maybe need a little more, maybe I'd even do them like two, three times in a week or something like that. But then that's usually enough for me. The depression is good or managed or whatever. I have enough, um, to go up. I, I got what I needed for the time being and that's helpful. But because I was making this documentary, I was like, okay, it helped with the depression. I wonder if, like instead of like feeling average though like what if i just had more mushrooms and like maybe i'd feel good mm -hmm. like let's see i'm making this documentary i can do this little experiment and so i just kept on doing mushrooms i was doing them like you know two to three times a week through the filming and i went from feeling average to feeling good and i was like let's go for great can i feel great and then i'm <laughs> sure as sure enough i'm like feeling great and and then I and I quit drinking and smoking cigarettes during the filming as well. And then that that like started launching me into because alcohol is um, a natural depressant, too. So that always kind of um, um, evened out some of those manic episodes for me because I had alcoholic I issues. And so I think mushrooms had a lot to do with it because I wasn't integrating because of my frequency of use. I got, I got cut. I love mushrooms and mushrooms have never had, I just had never done me wrong in my 20 plus years of using them. And I got a little cocky, you know, mm -hmm. and I like talking about this stuff now because for the psychonauts out there, um, you know, I'm a psychonaut. Um, I got, I got cocky. I got, I got foolish. Um, you know, I was really trying to, uh, like, this is important and I'm exploring these head spaces and bringing back this information. You know, I just wasn't following, you know, basic common sense integration protocol kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what we were trying to make was, was my early, um, how we were kind of conceptualizing the documentary early on was that this will be almost like a tutorial. Like we were thinking about the title was going to maybe be, so you're thinking about tripping and it was going to be about, um, we are going to show the history of psychedelics um, and then we are going to that would be like part one and then part two is going to be about setting intentions and what that's about and some of the research um, uh, with that and then and then the third part was going to be about tripping itself and then the fourth part was going to be about integration and then the fifth part was going to be about the future of psychedelics and that was kind of the structure that we were thinking of and um, had in our heads. And we were playing around with that and didn't know exactly what that looked like. You know, I and, and then also at the time I was doing a lot of psychedelics too. And so, you know, I would have like, I'd come up with an idea. Um, like, I got it. Like, I know what this needs to be now. And then and be very sure of myself. And then you know, come down from that trip and, and, 
integrate for a few days and be like, well, maybe it's not quite that. Okay, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. And then I do mushrooms again and be like, okay, this is what it needs to. I get like, and then, you know, next thing I know, I'm trying to like build the like Christopher Nolan inception uh, of documentaries <laughs> and like really rep- and like we were trying to like, I wanted the documentary itself to be like really trippy and a little bit of a head fuck too at the same time and all of that and figuring out how to do that and, and make it be like, uh, it, you know, this weird kind of emotional roller coaster that's insightful and bizarre and confusing and how do we make something like that? And, you know, um, uh, w- within that process, I was using psychedelics way too frequently. And, um, and that, so that's what we don't show in the, in the documentary. And, you know, there's a, there's a million things that I wish, and, and there is some, some, um, videos on the psychonautics, um, film, dot com website that shows some of the stuff that ended up on the cr- cutting room floor but this is the first documentary i've ever made but man it's like heartbreaking all of the stuff that ends up on the cutting room floor and the decisions that you have to make to keep everything within you know like the i, I think we ended up around 85 minute film or something like that and one of the things, and, and then, you know, my vision of things and the director, editor, and producer's vision of things, you know, there's compromises there too. But I do wish that people, and I'm, that's why I like talking about this on these podcasts, because I, I wish people knew a little bit more of the background of what was going on with me right then. So that, because especially I, I don't want people to, um, for them to watch the movie and then be like, well, the lesson that I learned from that is just to not do ayahuasca mm-hmm. and everything else is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, because one, everything else isn't necessarily okay. Two, ayahuasca can be absolutely wonderful for so many people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, so I would hate for people to have, a um, incorrect um judgment one way or another but you, you know you, you can all uh, we we would still be making the documentary for the next like 10 years you know nothing's ever going to be perfect you eventually have to like make some decisions and things get cut and yeah. and uh as, as an author there's... i know that especially when writing a book it's like you can oh, just yeah. keep rewriting at some point i believe the the phrase is like you you have to mur- you have to be ready to murder your babies um mm. And just like s- sign off on it being finished. Um, now, I, I, I again, I, I keep referencing that I want to go into your psychosis, what happened. Yeah. Um, sure. But something else has come up, and this is a pretty. I feel like this is a pretty sensitive question, so I hope that it's all right. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about your depression, uh, which is that you know it's it's increasingly I think common knowledge um, for people that a lot of comedians suffer from depression and yeah. possibly like they are hilarious people because that's a part of the coping mechanism that finds social, social function. And we've lost sure. great, great comedians um, yeah. to suicide and, and to things that are, don't look like suicide, but they are ultimately like a really slow drawn out suicide, like oh, excessive yeah. alcoholism and, and of drug course. use. And yeah. I'm wondering if you can, if you can comment on like in your industry amongst your, you know, your colleagues and your friends, like is, where do you feel like psychedelics might fit in, inside of the, of the comedy culture and what's sort of the oh. current rhetoric or, or, or discourse around depression, mental health? And, and what needs to be done in order to protect the, the lives of these people who bring joy to the rest of us. Well, boy, I have so much to say about all of those questions. So again, feel free to wrangle me in any time you want. But um, I would say that, uh, so there was a couple questions there. So I guess I'll, I'll try to answer one at a time. Um, one in terms of mental health and comedians and how much it, I mean, so there's, there's a few schools of thought here. Um, 
at least in terms of how I think about things personally, but I've, I've heard other people reflect on um, the condition of the the comedian and in similar ways. Is that because there is the the um, kind of cliche as the sad clown mm-hmm. um, in in the business? But one, there are a lot of really well-adjusted comedians out there a lot of them aren't that funny um but (laughs) um, (laughs) but but there there really are um and um you know who knows how much of this is like a cultural impact of of or when this changes over time just like you, you know the the idea of rock and roll used to be like throwing TVs out of hotel windows and stuff like that. I'm not sure it like that on a regular basis anymore. Um, and same thing with comedy. But I, I would say, so some people think that lots of people experience, are, are we, I'm we're, getting, we're, an, we're okay. We're okay. Just, just roll with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, a lot. Some people think that most people have these same problems. It's just that they aren't really allowed to talk about them. They aren't a lot. They don't. You know, they're not in a social environment, especially like a work environment where everyone's like, "Hey, you want that promotion? Well, you should be the one with the smile on your face all day, every day, ready to be yes, sir, ma'am, and do." your thing and and you're supposed to be a cheerleader around the office and there is a tremendous amount of pressure on people in workplace especially to behave and act in that way whereas i don't i don't think most people actually are uh near as happy at work as this they would maybe feel the pressure to be and it can play with social situations as well and so some people think like you know, maybe this is just um, comedians are just the ones talking about it, but this, this is the common human condition. Another thing that I personally think is that I think that there's a little bit of that, but in conjunction, um, comedians often get validated for being brave and vulnerable and sharing and all of that. And and so because of this positive reinforcement, it creates this kind of feedback loop where we almost have the opposite situation. So your average person is like expected to go go up and uh, in, into the office and, and be the fun guy around the office and cheer everybody up. Comedians almost like expected to like be real edgy or dark or something like that. So it's, So sometimes we almost over time, uh, like almost in like a Pavlovian kind of way of like, you have a bad day, you share it on stage, you get some laughs, you're like, oh, okay, Hmm. well, that got me some laughs. And then you keep on digging and exploring that side of yourself more than is actually there. You end up almost kind of fetishizing the the darkness. I feel like I've been guilty of that many of many times. I feel like I probably still am. Um, so those are two different ways that that I would look at it. Now, before um, you get into that, the third, Shane, can we can we cut the bit video feed um, if that's okay for you? Because of, uh, it's cutting out more and more, and I think if we cut the feed, then um, then it's just going to sound better. And that's yeah, fine. yeah, okay. So and then the third and then the third thing. Well, it's just the environment of like, it's a very party, um, you know, unhealthy, like uh, um, comedy and self-care aren't two things that you put together in your head very often. Hmm. You picture like like the, um, you know, Burt Kreischer now has his second special is just now on Netflix where he like is the wild party guy that uh, Burt Kreischer. I'm not talking, Bert Kreischer was in my documentary. He's a great guy and a, and a friend. But, you know, this is like, 
he goes out on stage and rips his shirt off and has this big beer gut and is drinking beer with everybody and is like this party animal, life of the party on stage. And um, and there's been a lot of that within comedy for a long time. And I, I get done, I don't drink um, anymore, but, um, and part of that was because you get done with shows and everyone wants to like buy you a shot or it's their birthday or they're celebrating this and that and they want to have some drinks and hang out with you. And um, so, yeah. Um, so, so there's that. And then the other one is in terms of would psychedelics be good for the comedy community? Absolutely. I mean, they'd be good for many, many, many communities, but they would be especially good for the comedy community. One, I mean, I think that they are, uh, if you're in a creative field, psychedelics are like taking steroids. Mm. Like if, if comedy if stand-up comedy was an Olympic sport, uh, psychedelics would be regulated and tested because they give you an unfair advantage. Um, and if you're if you're into like painting or any any kind of creative thing, psychedelics are a way of t- tapping into this creative reserve that is just not accessible on the natch. Now you can get there on psychedelics and eventually figure out how to like get your way back there through like meditation and yoga. But psychedelics are the starting point of finding out what is is possible in terms of those, those creative spaces and those other um, inner worlds. Um, And so uh, just, just in terms of creativity alone, I think it would be a boon. And then, um, you know, in terms of self-care um, and mental health stuff, I, I do think that they are pretty pervasive um, amongst the the comedy community. If for no other reason, like I said, it's like almost this, now it's this acceptable part of the culture. Now it's just like a lot of comedy is like, hey, who's the sickest? Who's like the most, the most messed up? Who had the craziest like, childhood or or who was like abused or had the bad parenting or was adopted or like like the the crazier the better like the more vulnerable you can be the better and so so that's kind of like rewarded and perpetuated and and i i think that there probably is um you know an over-reliance on um kind of pharmaceutical kind of antidepressants and that sort of thing within within the comedy community and so i think it would do worlds of difference and comedians are like really they're they're modern philosophers i'm that that is not to say that me or any other comedian is necessarily a good philosopher (laughs) i'm just saying that they are uh, philosophers they're they're as close to you know, um, uh, you know what what like the Greeks used to do, like getting together and like someone stands up in front of a bunch of people and shares ideas. Um, you know, stand up comedy is is really a, about the closest thing to that going on nowadays. Uh, other than like what I'm and now, there's like science talks popping up. Um, by the way, check out my science. And comedy shows stand up science. It's two scientists and two comedians on every show coming to a city near you. Go to shanemoss.com. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, <laughs> no, links links to that will be available more. in the show notes of this episode at jameswjesser.com. Uh, so yeah, you know that's that that's pretty interesting stuff. Um, because like I I reflect on that a lot. I feel like we've lost a lot of great artists and poets and comedians who I, I like this philosopher idea I, I've, I've thought of them as sort of like the the, the thermometers of, of culture like what's happening in culture is reflected in in what's funny and what's not funny in comedy um, and so you know I, I think about the level of like the amount of artists that we've that we've lost um, because of you know the consequences of trauma addiction depression um, and how many of them might have stuck around and not only, you know, maintained their craft, but deep, deepened it as a consequence of, of getting the type of, you know, experiential medicine they needed to resolve their past. 
um, yeah. you know, without, without blunting, without blunting their wit and, and their way in the world. Um, and psychedelics, you know, in the right context, uh, you know, with the right level of frequency, uh, you know, can, can help with that. Let's lean Absolutely. in, let's lean back into, uh, to the psychosis thing. So, um, ayahuasca you're you're getting ready to to film an ayahuasca experience you've already had one um i had had, I had, had a couple um well i i guess i had i had two in a row i i had a I had a thing that was like you you showed up you did ayahuasca you slept over and you did ayahuasca again in the morning yeah that's sort of like that the 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 weekend ayahuasca retreat model I've uh, I've done I've done similar, um, so you've got sort of this under your belt and you're like all right yeah sweet ayahuasca now I'll go in I'll have a big experience and then we'll dose it somewhere down in the middle to put it on camera, um, but things go awry on that big experience. Um, of course, you know some of this is yeah. really, really artistically and engagingly, you know, told in in your documentary. Um, but as you know, without giving too much away about the, about, like, without taking away oh. from the experience of the documentary, what happened? No, we don't. We don't need tra- to worry about that. I, I don't. I don't think that any of this will spoil the documentary okay, great, for great, anybody, great. and can totally talk about whatever. So um, then, I, so then, what happened? What happened? Like, what what was the experience um, yeah. that the ayahuasca offered, and what was the aftermath? math um immediately following and eventually into uh into hospitalization so because this story could take me days to tell if i wanted to i'll try to i'll try to give like the um cliff notes Mm -hmm. um version so if if within this um it's even more confusing than it's already inherently going to be. Uh, Let me know if you need any clarifications or if you want me to unpack or expand on anything. Um, So I took ayahuasca. I had just the absolute most beautiful, wonderful psychedelic experience of my entire life. Um, Probably second to that was um, taking mushrooms in a float tank, mm. um, which was, I would say, close to an ayahuasca-ish experience. Um, but um, so, you know, I had all these great, beautiful little messages from the universe, and it was kind of like telling me that that, you know, my role in this was to kind of communicate these experiences to others and, and to utilize the connections, not, not just me, but like all of us to utilize the connections that, that we have to keep on expanding this network of people who are having these experiences so that we can get more eyes on this. And I was in a unique position to do this because of like, you know, my science podcast and um, having the um, public, I'm, I'm, I'm no household name or anything like that, but having, you know, whatever little um, public voice and everything that I have. And it was kind of like, and I was kind of like, not really, I was just like, okay, you know, I wasn't judging that I wasn't, and I certainly wasn't like, excited about the possibility of like ha- being tasked with the some job of being some messenger or something like that um i was just like you know this is probably classic egocentrism and this is just you you get to these inner worlds of your brain and and a, a lot of it is very egocentric and Um, because egocentrism is like the starting point for all of our perception and cognition. And we only have, we only have access to the information that we have access to. So, you know, I know what's happening in my environment right now, and I have no idea what's happening across the town from the city that I'm in right now. It doesn't make this experience any uh, more meaningful than, than that. But, you know, this is, uh, I, I utilize the information that's around me and use that more and, and have more important, um, I, 
I, I give it more importance because that's all the information that I have available to me. So egocentrism is like pervasive and and um, unavoidable. And like when people talk about having like ego deaths or losing ego or whatever, like good luck. That's it's never going to happen. Um, but but um, so you know, I was telling myself all of this, but then it was like saying it was like showing me what was going to happen in the future. And one of the things that it said was that I was going to um, look crazy. I was going to be like made to look crazy. And that would get like that, that would get enough. That would get some people's attention where people that were like against psychedelics would be like, here's this guy that, that went crazy from psychedelics. But then when they actually talked to me, I'd be able to explain them in a reasonable way. And then they'd realize that they had judged incorrectly. And that was like how I would be able to, um, navigate communicating this message to other people. I didn't really make much of that. Um, but that was like kind of the prophecy or whatever that I was, that I was shown at the time. And there was two other things, um, that it said that, so there was like this new like DMT study that was like kind of being worked on and talked about. And I had chatted with the guy um, ab about this um, a, a couple times months earlier. Um, this DMT X extended t state DMT mm -hmm. thing that I think is still in the works. I've kind of lost touch since. But is it, um, is it Andrew Gallimore? Is that the person you were talking with? Um, Christopher Timmerman? Um, no, doesn't uh, matter. Ga Gallimore is one of the guys that offer authored with Strassman, the, the protocol for the extended. Uh, yeah. Thing. But anyways, was, I don't uh, mean to derail yeah. you. Yeah. No, no, you're fine. Um, it was, um, Daniel McQueen. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, there was that and then, it, so it was like, something about how I was going to be involved with that study or I was supposed to be like promoting that study or something like that um, it was what ayahuasca had had told me. Um, and uh, and again, I was just like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, I, I have a lot of weird thoughts when I'm tripping that I don't I don't even, you know, bother paying any attention to. I, I try not to take any like messages or anything like that too seriously. I think that's often when, when people um, go go wrong and mm -hmm. um, and error in their judgment of of what the experience was about. And then um, I I had um, another thing that was. So there was this scientist, and I can't I can't say their name because of a drug related thing. Okay. Um, but but there was a scientist that I was a big fan of, um, and they it it was like I needed to like work with them on how to change the dynamics of um how like education works and the transfer of information um much of it was like it was like i, I and you know this is years ago so i'm trying to recall i'm trying to recall a trip that happened two years ago okay. um not the easiest thing in the world but it was kind of like you know, we all kind of make these mental models and project on, on the future, and then they do have real life consequences. I'm going to plan out my day today, and then I'm going to go out and, um, you know, go rock climbing and go to dinner and those things that I have loosely planned and those mental models of me doing that influence me doing it. But, you know, but then unexpected things might happen when I actually go out to do that. And that's what has happened with humanity um you know like if if the if our ancestors the things that they were like trying to do to like better our lives if they would have 
known, you, you know, like as they're trying to like amass the stability and build cities, if they would have known um, some of the consequences of say like modern city city living, um, they would have like altered their their plans. And so, and there was something about how education used to be that used to be communal and teachers and uh, students like it wasn't it wasn't the same hierarchical relationship that is in a school today it was more like the teachers were teachers quote unquote were learning just as much from the students as as the students would be learning from them and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Um, just like a, a shaman or any psychedelic guide or therapist or whatever is like learning a lot about life and themselves, um, in the process of helping others. And so I got those like three things is like, this is what I supposed to go out and do. Okay. I didn't really take any of that seriously. Just had this really lovely trip and it was like, okay, okay. I, like this mission now and I these other crazy things happened like the house started shaking at one point and all this other stuff that just kind of sounds crazy to even talk about but it was impactful and I don't know what any of it means or how true any of it was but um it just it felt it did feel very much like a very specific message from some other world or the divine or what I like all these things that I am, you know, a very skeptical person with a science podcast and don't believe in. And, you know, it seemed very, very magical. And I was very excited and, you know, had a nice time. And the next day I woke up and I drove down and off this mountain and I had cell phone reception again. And the first text message that I got was from Daniel McQueen with the DMTX study. And he was like, hey, we are making the announcement um, for the study tomorrow. Um, and you're in Boulder um, or, or, or you're, you're, in, you're in Colorado. I'm wondering if you can come to Boulder. Um, because we actually want to announce you as the first participant hmm. um, to be studied in this DMTX study. And I was like, okay. Like, that's like exactly what ayahuasca said was going to happen, kind of. And then, <clears throat> and then I checked my Twitter direct messages, and I had gotten this, message kind of out of the blue from that scientist um that came up in the ayahuasca experience and and he doesn't study education or anything he has views on it but it's not his area of expertise and he's like hey i was just thinking about you here's this here is this um article that i wrote about how we need to change the education system mm. And I was like, huh, that is correct. And I even wrote him, I was like, and this is why I can't say his name. I was like, you know, I have to tell you, I was just thinking about you last night during an ayahuasca trip. And he's like, that's crazy. I had this idea on mushrooms. Mm. Mm. And, and I was like, what is going on? And then like the next day I went to this. So it was this Gaia TV was recording this kind of announcement about this potential DMTX study where people are going to be doing DMT for four hours or whatever. And I go there and I'm like hearing about the plans and then like, you know, they announce me as the first participant and everything. And like, this is just so strange. Like this doesn't feel real. Hmm. Um, and, but I was like really just, I would say I was like hypomanic at the time, but I just kept on getting more excited. And then my ideas kept on getting more and more creative. And I was trying to figure out like, how are these messages being delivered? And like one of the, one of the people at, um, at the DMTX 
talk was talking about how, um, you know, time is not, doesn't work in the way that we interpret it. And he thinks that DMT is accessing these things that are in this other dimension that are, that are not bound by the, by time as we know it. And I just was spending a lot of time thinking about that and, and time and how you could pass messages, um, through time forward and backwards. And as I did that, it just felt, it started feeling like as I was coming up with ideas about what the future might be like or the changes that this could make, it almost seemed like the world was changing um, around me. It would seem like I would have an idea about something and then that would already happen. Like it would, I'd be like, this should happen in the future. And then I would see like signs of it occurring. Hmm. And, you know, I'm sure this is just like, you know, in hindsight, now that I'm a uh, regular old person again, this is just like runaway confirmation bias um, or whatever. But it just started, at first it was exciting. And it was like, am I changing the world with my thoughts or whatever? And then it was kind of like, it got more and more, um, weird. It got, it, it just felt like it just kept on feeling less like reality. And I was like, is this just a dream that I'm in? Has this always just been a dream? How, how are these do like, is any of this, it's almost as if we're in the m middle of a storybook and m much like your, your ideas and everything like have clear impl implications for your future ac actions and every choice that you make right now has, has these downstream effects in the future going s forward in, in your life story. Um, and is kind of creating that, um, in the future. It's also somehow, um, filling in, you are in the present filling in the past as well. And the past is this, um, illusory, this illusion that keeps on updating and, um, and, and there is no such thing as time. Um, and it just got, it started getting more confusing, still pretty exciting and positive spirits, like creative, thinking of some pretty cool ideas, I guess. But I wasn't sleeping. I was sleeping like an hour a night or two. Mm. And then about a week after that ayahuasca experience, I was getting more and more manic and still hadn't slept and was getting a little weirder with my ideas, was starting to shut down so I wouldn't like have people looking at me funny when I told them about my, you know, um, grand ideas about how the universe worked. And then I ate mushrooms mm -hmm. and went to this Roger Waters concert and just all of these things that I had thought um, just started happening. And it was like, it was as if everything, it just felt like a dream. It felt like everything that had ever happened was so, was so like this, this exact moment that I was experiencing could happen. And then it was like, it's as if there's like this um, moving, like, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, um, like a vortex or like central um, area of, of like narration or something for the story of life. And it bounces around and at some point in every, anyone's life, they'll, they'll have they'll like everyone will at some point in their life 
see and feel this moment where everything has clicked into place in just such a way that they'll realize that all of their life has lived to this one moment that might be incredibly insignificant. You might just be tying your shoes and realize like, oh, this entire like 11, 12 billion year universe has been building toward this moment of me tying my, my shoes right now because that's going to have some other influence and, and some other impact on something in the future that you don't have the information or access to. Um, but but it's almost as if you're like kind of being guided in some in some way. We all are, are all of this is. And that was a really it felt very real to me. And and usually I can kind of dismiss any thoughts like that mm -hmm. that um, and I'm skeptical of them, but it felt very real. And I started losing it like it became it became very uh, like I didn't know if the whole world of the whole universe if any of it even existed if it was all in my head even if it is in my if it is in my head then I'm responsible for everything that's that's going on and like any suffering that's happening is because it's like a creation of my own mind. And, and so like I'm guilty of creating that suffering because of whatever thoughts that I'm having. And, and then it was just this, um, you know, loss of, of a sense of any kind of free will, any kind of agency and a feeling of, being used but not knowing to what end and didn't know if this was am i in heaven right now am i in hell am is uh, is any of this real am i trapped in a vr simulation right now and like i'm being tortured or i'm being studied or um uh, you know uh those sorts of thoughts started coming into my mind really rapidly and definitely not in a, um, you know, a lot of people, I, I'm jealous in a lot of people that have like similar breakthroughs, but they're like, I got this message from the universe and I believe now and I'm so grateful for it. There was nothing, I didn't like any aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, I found it to be troubling and I didn't want any of the, responsibility that came along with um being in charge of the universe in any way <clears throat> or even thinking that i was or am i crazy or am i losing my mind and and that and that's when things just started spiraling and then you know it was like another week or two um after that of still being manic and not really sleeping that the psychosis got worse and worse, the paranoia got worse and worse. And, um, yeah. So, you know, what's really, I find very interesting here is like listening to you describe the ideas that you're having. Um, these, none of these things I'm like, well, that sounds crazy, man. Like none of that. All I was like, yep, yep. Yeah. I know yeah. what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, it sounds actually it sounds pretty similar to how I see the world, um, and 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 what I find interesting is is not not that the content itself was particularly crazy, but the but your internal um, reaction to the the this content coming up, whatever structures that you had in you or didn't have in you, resulted in you getting into a dangerous. Um, relationship to these ideas and a, and a dangerous way of, of sort of conducting yourself in your life, which then, you know, like you said, led into paranoia. And, and I believe in the documentary, you mentioned that you were pretty sure that like everyone was against you, that the FBI and the CIA and the time police were all coming to yeah. find you because you had, you know, they knew that you knew that you could create reality and and you were doing stuff that you weren't supposed to be doing and, and yada 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 but and i can see like it gets to a certain point and all of that where it's like whoa this is really 
you know, n- now we're now we're really off in in the deep end here. Um, we're pretty off the rails at this point. But up until then, I mean, these are ideas that seem to be reflected in ancient mythologies, um, and uh, and you know, pretty commonly discussed in in sort of like the underground psychedelic philosophy subcultures. Um, but that they landed in you in a way that sort of launched you into a very dysfunctional state of being. Um, what was what? So there's a particular question that I have, and I'm not sure if now's the right time. Um, yeah, we'll say we'll say now's the right time because I want to ask you. Eventually, you get admitted to the hospital. Actually, let's go there first. You get admitted to the hospital. Um, and understandably so. You haven't slept in weeks. Um, you're likely acting very strange. Your f- friends and family, your your girlfriend, I believe you mentioned, becomes you know very concerned for your well being, and you get admitted to the psychiatric ward of a hospital. What happened when you got there? Um, it was really scary. Um. I had to sit in some room for a while um, for a really long time. I felt like it was like an interrogation or something like that. I like delete. I was like deleting things off my phone and like I I was worried. I was like getting busted. I wasn't sure if it was it. I like I also didn't know if it was actually a psych ward or if it was like some other thing and if they were trying to like in my mind there was like this war between like different drugs and gatekeepers and stuff and they were trying to like get information to me but and i was trying and i didn't want i was like protecting the people that um you know gave me psychedelics and the psychedelic community and everything and people were like after where i got the psychedelics, I, I don't think anyone cared where I got psychedelics from right. at all in hindsight. But that's, but that's like, you know, what, what the feeling of it was like at the time. And then, um, you know, I, and then I got admitted in there and, you know, there's a bunch of pretty intense people in the psych ward and some of them like just come up and like want to be your friend right away. Uh, others like are really scared themselves. Others are like kind of aggressive and territorial. And, um, and it was also like, it was so strange because it was almost like a wizard of Oz kind of scenario. I mean, my, my brain was working in such a like hyper associative manner at the time where like everything's related to some other thing on like a, a, a really um, intense level. And um, I felt like each person in the psych ward was like, oh, this is like the crazy version of my aunt, or mm-hmm. this is the crazy version of this one rapper that I like, or mm-hmm. this is the crazy version of this artist I work with. Um, and, and I, I thought like some people were like delivering me like secret messages. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then like, but everyone's on the same page in there. So like, they also think I'm delivering them secret. We're all talking in like these weird codes that none of us un- actually understand, wow. um, but are like trying to make sense of. And and it was like, a, I was like, oh, is this like a game of how to get out of here? And, you know, I'd see someone, like one person would be wearing a white shirt, one person would be wearing like the scrubs or whatever shirt and I'd be like oh okay so which am I supposed to wear the white shirt or the blue one and then that would lead my decision to like like this is if you figure out exactly the right puzzle then they let you out and so then I'm like going and I'm changing and now now, next thing I know I'm like okay now my pants are on backwards and I'm wearing one sock maybe that's like the 
key that gets me out of it. And that is that is not the if you're looking to get out of the psych ward, backwards <laughs> back, backwards pants and one sock is not your your key to the exit door. Um, but but then but but all of these other like schizophrenic and like paranoid people too are like looking at me doing that and then being like, oh, maybe this guy's on to something. And then there, now everyone's wearing one fucking sock. And, and, and like, and then it's just like the crazy just snowballs and we're all like feeding off one another. And it is fucking bonkers. I was only in there for a week and it was fucking terrifying. I mean, it was really enlightening and I'm happy that I went through it because to think that people spend like years in an institution like that. And the, and the terrifying thing is, is like, I would have much rather been in jail Hmm. because in the sense that even though this is like slightly nicer than a jail, not by much, but a little bit, um, they, they don't give you a time you don't get like a sentence so Mm. i didn't know if i was going to be in there for like two more hours or for the rest of my life i i had no idea and i couldn't like get that information it was really hard to get a sense of no one it didn't seem like anyone was being honest with you and then like the people there all they're they're all like they all have clipboards and they're like making marks and taking notes and like what are they taking notes about? What what did I do? Did, are they talking about me? Are they not talking about me? Is this part of an evaluation? Is this some test? It was fucking awful. Um, but you know, I I was shortly after I got there, they gave me whatever they gave me. I think I slept for like thirty hours or something like that. Mm. Something crazy. I forget. They told me afterwards, but I I've slept for more than a day. Uh, um, and, um, then, and I was still, I mean, I was, I was still crazy after leaving the psych ward. Um, I don't know if I should use the word crazy or blah, blah, blah. Anyways, it's just shorthand for what I was experiencing, but, um, I, I, was you know on some pretty serious mood stabilizers Mm -hmm. and they did you know calm down the fire a little bit in my head and get things kind of under control and manageable and so you know i i came back down and i i stayed on those stabilizers for a while and um you know it was a whole it was a whole weird bizarre um journey but uh so you know there's i've actually had uh you know i I help people with integration coaching and i i helped one person um and as as i was as i was you know going through the session with them it became increasingly obvious that they weren't um they weren't interested in my in in my sort of encouragement for them to look at the personal narrative um, but we're really looking for me to validate and substantiate like the larger cosmic interplay that they are now like in the know of and uh, like the mass synchronicity program that was like trying to wake them up to some sort of amazing truth that they needed to bring to the world. And right. um, I was like, okay, I don't think that that is something that you should personally focus on. I think that that going down that road is going to trip you up and that it'd be better to focus on, you know, like what is the, you know, what is the historical context of, of your early life that led you to, you know, having a, having visions that manifested in this particular way and to these emotional themes. Uh, and they sort of heard me, but I, I walked away feeling like, I'm not sure if this person um, is, I'm not sure what they're going to get out of this. And I found out a couple days later that they had been admitted to the psych ward with, with, a being in a, a manic episode. 
Um, mm. And it's interesting, again, because it seems like some people have these ideas. Like, I've had these ideas. I've thought about these things. I mean, the earlier portion of, of what you're talking about, it's represented in, in philosophies like Shaivism and other things about like structures of time and, and all this stuff. And yet other people, and, and, and stay relatively stable. And then other people, something happens and it goes to this weird extreme level. And it's almost like you're constantly tripping on a very high dose of psychedelics. Um, and, 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 and it's just interesting for me as like listening, I'm not really sure where my thoughts are. I feel like maybe I'm just like decompressing with, from such an intense story and like feeling a lot of myself in your experience. Um, and yeah, and it's all just very interesting me, to me, like where the line gets drawn between, wow, you've got some super eclectic ideas now to, whoa, um, I think you need psychiatric help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay, so here's, here's a couple questions now that I've sort of like off gassed a little bit of my, of my distress just listening to your experience. Um, when you were in the institution, how did they engage your ideas? Um, and how much of the original ideas that led you down that path stuck around and how much of it, you know, just became exclusively absorbed um, in this sort of like, you know, what was the shorthand? Crazy reality that you're in, uh, in, in the institution. Like how, how did your, like your caregivers engage your ideas? Like what kind of treatment did they offer in that sense? Or did they just listen and medicate like, I'm curious what they did other than giving you drugs and a space to sleep to help you come back to a place where you were stable enough to be released from the hospital. Um, I don't know. I mean, first off, I kind of shut down and stopped sharing any ideas with like the closest I would have to like sharing an idea is like whispering it to another one of the patients in the psych ward or whatever that I thought was like on the same level. Um, and, and then that always like creeped me out too, cause they'd have some even crazier response and, um, and it just was really confusing. I basically just was like, I did ayahuasca. Um, I was filming a documentary about psychedelics. I did too many psychedelics. I got paranoid, lost my mind. I was like, it, it just, I just didn't come down from from a trip. I'm back down now, even though I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, my my girlfriend and family they my family especially they don't know anything about these experiences and much of this is about like their own fear and that's why they like hospitalized uh, me and um and uh i need to get out of here i have i have work to do i'm not a harm to anybody i'm not a harm to myself um and you know they eventually uh, you know, one of the doctors in there, she had shamanic training and stuff like that. And so she was, she was, um, open to the idea of the psychedelic experiences a little more. And she's ultimately the one that signed off on letting me out. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a tricky position for them too, because she even straight up asked me, she was like, Okay, I'm gonna let you out of here. You aren't gonna like go murder somebody or someone, are you? Mm -hmm. Like, well, no. But like, what do you think I would say? I mean, I uh, do, do, what do, is that like? If some, if I did go and murder someone, then she's like, well, I asked him. Right. I, just... I asked him, and he said he wasn't going to. So Hands you up. know, plausible deniability. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Now, looking, I mean, like this is this is curious for me because it's like it's 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 so obvious that at some point you crossed over the edge from from whoa, I'm grappling with like a mega download to I am in a full blown schizophrenic psychotic episode. Um, now, 
I mean, th- th- how I delineate that is kind of I don't I don't really know how to how to do that, and I, I'm not really trying to make a stand for you know biological psychiatry or or I I don't know how to make a claim against like say the shamanic origins of mental illness or anything like that. Those are that's infused in the statement, but I I'm not trying to make any particular stance here. But at some point, you you've you clearly crossed a line um, and went into a place where it was really um, like a dangerous place for you to be in psychologically. Yeah. Um, looking back, I have two questions here, um, and the first one is that looking back, is there something that was missing for you insofar as support? Um, or understanding is there something that was missing for you in the like immediately following the ayahuasca experience that the lack of that type of support is what sent you over the line like when you look back is there something or or something that someone could have done for you at that time that could have helped you integrate those experiences and those ideas um before you cross that line? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to blame anyone but myself for what happened. And, you know, part of it was the ayahuasca thing. I was like, I was also supposed to, it was supposed to be two nights in a row. And I left like, I got the message that I need from this experience. And I don't even need to do ayahuasca again or whatever. And I left. And I think that actually, like, had I stayed and done ayahuasca again, I might have, like, finished and got, like, a a more complete picture of of what this was actually supposed to be rather than the confusing Mm. um, vague message that I I got. Who knows? So so maybe I didn't do enough ayahuasca. That's a possibility. Um, And then, um, but, you know, the person the medicine person that gave me the ayahuasca, they were supportive the whole time and they were always available and always a phone call away. I mean, they, they almost, they almost flew to where I was just to help me out. Mm. Um, when I was going through my tough time and they were trying to talk me through it and everything, I was a little paranoid at the time and didn't know if they were like in on things or what. Um, but they were a great resource. Um, my girlfriend was like it was hard because she was the person that like I trusted the most in my life and so I just kind of um I thought that I guess I felt like I was confiding these ideas with her, like knowing like, Hey, I know this sounds a little crazy, but since you're the person I trust more than anyone, I'm going to share this with you. And when she like, wouldn't, wasn't receptive to my ideas or they were like concerning to her that made me like, try to be like, Oh no. Okay. Let me, let me explain this another way. And it, like, led me to be kind of, like, frantic in my thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like, not not that it was her fault for responding that way, but it, it just, like, it. and then in my paranoid states, it made me feel like she was in on it. Mm. Um, and, like, she was part of the trick or whatever. So I guess someone dealing with someone in that state i would say that unfortunately you kind of have to like almost go along with what they're saying to a small degree and you definitely can't be like well i don't think that's what's happening and i think you're losing it right now um because that that like triggers this very defensiveness and everything and so i mean that's that's the only thing that i can really think of but i i mean i don't I don't blame anyone but myself for what happened and I don't really even regret my experience other than the stress and the impact that it had on my girlfriend and my family. Hmm. Um, Outside of that, I thought it was all like 
pretty valuable in hindsight. It's something that I look back on as um, a really instrumental part of my development. Um, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm doing like pretty good now. And in terms of self care, I'm doing as good as I've ever been. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, even just listening to the story, uh, feels, feels value, <laughs> feels valuable to me just to, just to hear, just to hear of your journey. Um, and so I imagine that that's, that's going to be a common thread for the other listeners as well. And other people who have heard your story, um, we're running, we're running pretty long here. So I'll, I'll bring these, these final two questions up. Uh, I don't think that they'll take, um, too long. I know I definitely wonder about, uh, if you had, if you had a Jungian inspired psychotherapist yeah. at the very beginning after that, you know, someone who you could tell all the crazy ideas to, and they could help you track down towards the archetypes, but then funnel yeah. down into personal yeah. stuff to sort of bring you out of the transpersonal and ground you back um, into, into your life as Shane Moss and not the Messiah or whatever, you know, whatever construct right. is coming up there. Um, but the, the first question is looking back at the early revelations, the early reveries after ayahuasca and, and the very curious and, and not uncommon experience of almost telepathy, of almost knowing the future, like you and the scientist and then getting the call about the DMT. Um, can you look back at those and do you still, do you lean into them and, and do you feel any like lingering legitimacy that like, whoa, those are actually very interesting and curious ideas that you can participate in or entertain in? Um, or th is there anything that you, you take out of that other than, oh, this was a good learning experience? Or are there any philosophical or ontological um, constructs out of that experience that you can go back in now from a stable place and say, yeah, you know, these still have valid place? Or, or do you see all of it now as like, no, that was just my big psychosis and that's where it exists in me now and I've learned from it and I've moved on, but I don't entertain those ideas or somewhere in the middle? I stopped entertaining those ideas for some time because I felt they were triggering. I felt I opened up some pathway in my mind that would um, potentially lead to another manic state mm -hmm. if I um, let myself um, get carried away with, um, entertaining those ideas for, um, too long of a time. And I'm now in a place where I've started writing about them again and exploring them. And, um, you know, my, my take at the end of the day is that what I am the most interested in, um, is less about, are we living in a simulation or something like that, which I think is maybe the case, but more about, um, um, I think that there are these, I think that there's a multiverse of perception and worlds and et cetera, inside of our minds and our subconscious that, that our, our consciousness arises from our consciousness is just like the very, the very, bare minimum tip of the iceberg of what we kind of need to be filled in with at the moment. And that, um, these psychedelic experiences give you like a little bit of a peek under the hood. And this can be something that is, um, you know, a, a powerful tool, just, just like, just like science uses various, primes and stuff like that and studies to tease apart um you know various aspects of what drives behavior or that sort of thing or, or or what kind of priming will will lead to this person making this decision um and then then we understand more about um what's happening with the brain um under our conscious awareness i i do think that psychedelics might be a gateway to that world. I'm still where I'm at right now is I am, I still find myself resistant to things that are of the more spiritual, mystical, um, 
universal consciousness sort of nature. And at the same time, I've had enough of my own personal experiences um, that I really am at a loss to explain in any other way other than some universal consciousness, some simulation theory, some um, some sort of something that resembles mysticism. Um, and so I find it a little confusing, and I, I guess in that way, I, I guess I, I find the most value and interest in understanding our own minds. And to what psychedelics can be used to, toward that end is my... Uh, main area of focus and it's also where I'm the most useful it's it's um you know I I would have to if I wanted to start exploring some more of the spiritual mystical sides of things I would have a lot of catching up to do um Mm -hmm. I in terms of reading books and researching and everything else um but I really have a uh pretty um special understanding of evolutionary theory and neuroscience and psychology and those sorts of things. Um, the things that we talk a lot about on the here we are podcast, um, available each week for free and (laughs) (laughs) five star rating in iTunes. And, um, (laughs) and, um, you know, I feel like I am the most useful um, in that regard, in that there might be, um, there is like a bigger picture of things. It might be, there might be a reason why there's these different kind of characters popping up within these psychedelic communities. And there's like different sex, sex of the psychedelic communities, mm-hmm. um, you know, where people have these different, uh, completely different takes on it. And I think that, that, um, it's all part of piecing together this massive puzzle that no one of us can, can figure out ourselves. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely, I can really lean into that. I like the idea that we're all sort of like unconsciously, but uh, cooperatively trying to tease out a little bit more of the meaning uh, of the mystery without with, with sort of like a, un, an undying mysteriousness to it all anyways, because the mystery will always be a mystery, um, despite how much we figure out. Uh, so that leads into this final question, last question here before we get all the handles and the, and the directions and the URLs and the, and the yada yada. Um, at this point, are psychedelics off the table for you? Um, no. Um, I One, I've done mushrooms since that time, but I've also had some manic episodes um, since that time from maybe mushrooms and also from maybe MDMA. I can't, I can't figure it out exactly. Um, because it happens like long after the fact, it doesn't like, I don't necessarily like trip and not come down. I trip. And then like, that's like the very, very little start of like a manic episode that then is fully expressed like a month later or something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's that or if it's just like the place that I'm at or if this is a natural cycle for me now or if I drank too much coffee or I didn't exercise enough. or It, seem, it seems like there's lots and lots of factors um, and that probably psychedelics are, are one of them. Um, but I've definitely been... I've been feeling like a calling back toward DMT lately, and I'm not the type of person to like feel callings. Um, and it's been a couple years, and it kind of scares the shit out of me, even though I've never, I've only had a few bad DMT experiences, and they were all, all when I was drunk. 
Um, I, I mean, I had like one or two other troubling ones um, outside of that, but they've for the most part been um, great every time. But, you know, the consequences of them is that sometimes it makes me think too much about this reality not being real and the DMT space being the actual reality. Mm. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I had, I had considered doing mushrooms last night. Actually, I, I had considered doing a small cap and cause I was, I was doing a float tank last night and, um, and that that would have kicked things into high gear a little bit more. Certainly uh, does. <laughs> uh, mushrooms in a float tank is a beautiful thing, but um, you know I really like where I'm at right now, and I'm being I'm getting into self care in a way that I haven't before, and where. Like I've, I've been doing a lot of yoga and things like that, that are like this exercise, making you feel good stuff is something that like, Oh, this is, that's an actual, yeah, that's a real thing. (laughs) I guess I know what people have been talking about. I guess there are endorphins and such that get released. Hmm. Well, you know, Shane, um, thank you so much uh, thank for, you. for sharing for sharing here and and being so transparent um, about about your journey in your documentary and in your, in the various other media that you produce. Yeah. I think it's, um, I mean, as as a comedian, you mentioned, you know, like like the the current the currency of comedy is 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 vulnerability uh, currently, and uh, I appreciate that even outside of the, the comedic realm, you you bring a you bring a candidness to this conversation that I think is uh, quite valuable. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I do hope for you that your self care continues to maintain. And in that process, you may or may not be able to experience psychedelics without any mass disturbances in your life. Uh, Cause yeah. it seems like you're doing good work and it'd be, it'd be nice to have you around. Um, and uh, why don't you, why don't you end us off here with uh, where we can find out more about what you do where we might be able to see Psychonautics if it's uh, publicly available um, yeah. and all that. Psychonautics is available on iTunes and Amazon and Vimeo and YouTube and all sorts of other like platforms like Xbox and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the, you can go to psychonauticsfilm.com if you, if you want to find out more and, and get some of the stuff that was on the cutting room floor and that sort of thing. Um, I would just recommend going to Shane Moss, M A U S S dot com. And that will be the, because there's also my podcast here. We are, which you could go to here. We are podcast.com to find all the episodes there. But um, Shane Moss dot com is the main central hub for everything, including my, my live show, which is half science, half comedy. Um, coming to a city near you, join my email list, and uh, it's called Stand Up Science, and and trying to put together my my fall and um, tour for next spring right now. Great. Well, uh, I'll make sure for the listeners that all of those links are available at jamesdbjesso.com for the show notes to this episode. Uh, again, Shane, thanks for thanks for being on the show. Thanks for hanging around for that little bit of extra time here to uh, go deep into your story. I really appreciate it, and I don't doubt uh, the listeners will as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. And cut. Okay, that is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for sharing it with your friend via social media platform, via little notes, you know, that you pass back and forth to each other randomly on the street, slipping them into each other's pockets, you know, whispering into each other's ear about how you should check out Adventures of the Mind. And, you know, whatever else that you do to help spread the word around this podcast, really appreciate it. Please uh, buy some stuff. That'd be great. Um, All the things that you could buy that support the show are at jamesdbjesso.com forward slash shop. Or you could become my patron. Really like that because Patreon enables me to essentially have a reliable, steady income. And I'm very close to my first goal, which is essentially to be earning a living wage uh, with the podcast, which is very, very exciting. Um, So becoming a patron and helping me hit that goal would be amazing. Um, Also, there's a cool collection of 
internal opportunities or uh, exclusive opportunities for patrons, uh, such as getting access to various talks um, and other things that other people just don't get access to, as well as early access uh, to podcasts and basically a whole Dropbox folder full of stuff. Um, that other people don't get access to. So basically become a patron. It'd be awesome. Please do that. jamesdavidjasso.com forward slash support for all that info. It's very easy to find in the description to wherever you are listening to this podcast or watching it. Just click through. And uh, yeah, thanks. And I'll see you on the next episode or at Breaking Convention. Okay, bye.